Well, in our scripture reading this evening, we turn once more to the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 10. And uh, we're going to read from verse 34 uh, to the end of the chapter. Uh, we began looking at this uh, sermon that Peter is preaching before a, a, a congregation of Gentiles, non-Jewish people. And uh, we only really saw the introduction uh, last Sunday evening. Well, we're going to get more into the uh, bulk of the sermon and then see the amazing result of that preaching uh, with God the Holy Spirit coming upon the congregation. So it's uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began uh, from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God appointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us, who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, uh, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized, to have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. Well, may the Lord add his blessing to his precious word uh, this evening. Well, let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we, <coughs> we come before you uh, this evening and uh, Lord, as we've read those words from the scriptures, even as we have sung that hymn, we uh, would acknowledge ourselves that the Lord Jesus Christ is indeed uh, the beautiful Saviour, the way, the truth, and uh, the life. And uh, forgive us, Father, we pray, when the, uh, the things of this world uh, so often seem to be more important than uh, our, our spiritual walk, uh, our uh, heaven itself. Uh, Lord, we, we need your help tonight. We need, Lord, uh, to refresh our batteries, our spiritual batteries, as it were, uh, to face all that will be before us in this coming week. Uh, we need your strengthening. And we need your help. And uh, Lord, we thank you and praise you that uh, when we uh, do come to you and we do ask for that help and that strength, uh, then you are our strength indeed. Uh, uh, Lord, we think of the scriptures, we speak of the Lord Jesus as being our strength, our song, our saviour. And uh, we rejoice in that. We've been singing songs um, and praising you. And we thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ is our saviour, our redeemer. We thank you, Father, that uh, again, for those who are your people, we're just travelling uh, alo along in this world. But this is not our home. This is not our destination. We thank you 
that we have a, a home, an eternal home. Uh, thank you, as Paul put it, about running the race and receiving the crown. We rejoice, Lord, uh, that we who know you and love you, that, Lord, you will keep us going forward until that time when you, uh, you call us to be with yourself and that to be uh, crowned with a, the crown of righteousness. But it's not our righteousness. It'll be Christ's righteousness and clothed in his righteous garments and coming into the, your presence and into your holy throne uh, as those who have been cleansed of our sins and have uh, become part of your family. And Lord, uh, we, we, we long for that. We wait for that. And Lord, as we wait and we know and think of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to to put that into fulfillment. Uh, we know also, Lord, that you have us uh, to be on earth, to serve you, to be faithful to you. And we, we seek to do that. Uh, although we would confess, Lord, that we so often stumble, uh, so often, uh, Lord, we don't do what we should do, and the things that we should do, we don't do. And yet, Lord, we praise you and thank you that like uh, little children, you still love us, you still care for us, you, you pick us up uh, and, and push us on, and we pray, Father, that we might know more and more about you and of you uh, in this coming week that is before us. Uh, and Lord, we would pray for the life of the church here. We think of the activity, uh, the activities. We think, Lord, of uh, uh, mothers and toddlers on Tuesday and pray, Lord, again, that there may be many uh, conversations about the Lord Jesus. We uh, pray, Father, that the young, uh, young children that are gathering will, uh, Lord, uh, it will be precious seed that will be sown into young hearts that will, uh, you will uh, uh, cause to grow and uh, bless. Uh, we think, Lord, of uh, the members' meeting uh, next Sunday and ask your blessing upon that also. And thank you, Lord, that we can gather we thank you, Lord, as uh, members of your church. We're stewards of what you have given to us. We want to be faithful stewards. We want this church, Lord, your church, uh, to be a faithful witness and testimony uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ as the one who lives, the one who died upon a cross, the one who lives again, and the one who is coming again. And we do pray for uh, the community at large, around this church, in our, around our homes, amongst our families and our friends. Oh, Father, we do pray for the working of God, the Holy Spirit, uh, in the lives of other people, in the, uh, speaking to the souls of other people, that they may be a drawing, a drawing to Christ. And we pray that you would use us uh, as your instruments in your hand to do that. Uh, we long, we desire, O oh Lord, to see souls coming to faith in the Lord Jesus. And will you do that? Will you build your church here, we pray, and build us, Lord, in numbers and in faith and in love, one for another. And Lord, as we come to your word, give us those receptive minds, receptive ears, eyes, and hearts to receive from you. And when we leave this place, when we go back to our homes, Lord, may it be that we would be rejoicing that we have such a Savior and you as such uh, our Father God and that, Lord, in your mercy and your grace that you loved us so much and care for us so much. Oh, Lord, Lord help us to be a, a rejoicing people, a praising people uh, and a serving people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we go to Acts chapter 10, and uh, the verses we're going to be looking at, uh, uh, mostly verse 34 uh, to 48, although we are not actually going to get back, get to the end of the chapter uh, this, uh, this evening, but we're going to deal with a great deal of it. And I think one of the things we can say about this uh, chapter is that it's all about God. It's God's be the glory. Uh, although uh, we have this scene of Peter uh, preaching, 
uh, yet it's about God and, and, and God breaking in uh, to that, uh, that meeting, that congregation uh, gathered to hear. So that brings us uh, to the introduction this, this evening. And that is to just remind ourselves of the unusual circumstances surrounding the fact that Peter is there standing. He is going to be preaching a sermon to perhaps he would have thought only a few days before the most unlikeliest of congregations. Uh, previously, uh, the gospel had gone out to uh, the Jews and to Samaritans, but not to the Gentiles. But there have been unusual circumstances that have happened. Uh, circumstances that, that uh, uh, centered around prayer. Uh, there was a prayer time that Cornelius, a God-fearing Gentile, had, and he saw an angel who instructed him to go and send for Peter. Peter, uh, the following day, is on that housetop, and he's praying, and God gives him a vision and speaks to him and tells him that with God there is no partiality, there's no favoritism. And so we come uh, to uh, the sermon. When Peter gets there, uh, gets into the home of Cornelius, he discovers that Cornelius has gathered a congregation for him. Friends, family, um, perhaps one or two servants and soldiers are there in the congregation. Uh, Peter has come with a few companions who are Jewish believers in Jesus. And so that's the... That's the the congregation that is before Peter, he stands and he preaches, and he begins his preaching, uh, as we see it from verse 34 to verse 36. Now, last uh, Sunday evening, we spoke about this, and we said, uh, I think quite rightly, that this is just Peter, uh, Peter's introduction, giving an idea of uh, what he is going to say. So we read that Peter opened his mouth, and said in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, no favoritism. That's what Peter has learned. That's why he's able to stand before that congregation and preach. And he says in verse 35, that in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him, by God. And the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. And what Peter is going to do, what Peter is wanting, to convey to them that he is going to preach Christ Jesus. And I said that was just uh, the introduction. So he moves on in verse 37 uh, to th verse 38, and we get to the first point. And it's, it's interesting that there uh, Peter starts where the people are, what they know, or what do they know. Well, this is what he says in verse 37, verse 38 of Acts 10. He says, That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with his Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. So what do these people know? Well, perhaps we've got to uh, think, first of all, where they are. They're in Caesarea. Now, Caesarea is a, is a kind of little Rome. Uh, it's where a lot of Roman soldiers retired to. Uh, it was a, a garrison town for the Roman soldiers. Uh, if they were needed anywhere in the Palestine, most of those soldiers would have come from Caesarea and, and sort out the problems and the difficulties. So this, was, this is not Jewish territory, really. This is Gentile territory, although they did have a synagogue. And what do they hear? Well, if you were God-fearing like Cornelius, you would have heard the talk and the gossip from the Jews about religion. Uh, one thing you can say about uh, the Jews in these days, where well, they were very religious, and they liked to talk about religion. And there was a lot to talk about in those years. There was John the Baptist. And that's what uh, Peter begins to start with, John the Baptist. Because John was, uh, 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 sorry, Peter was uh, one of John the Baptist's original disciples, wasn't he? And uh, they may have well heard of the crowds going out into the 
uh, around Galilee, uh, around the, uh, the, the river there, and the, the people were being uh, uh, baptized, and, and John was preaching that the kingdom of God is coming. That's verse 37. He says, uh, that which, uh, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. So John was preaching about forgiveness of sins. He was preaching about looking to the coming of the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. But then he moves on to speak about Jesus. Now, even in sleepy Caesarea, they would have heard of Jesus. Uh, Jesus, the teacher. Jesus, the miracle worker. Uh, Jesus, the healer. Jesus, the rabbi. And uh, we read of this in verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. He'd been a, a man who uh, people were saying he was able to drive out demons. How? Why? Well, says Peter, for God was with him. Of course, we could add <laughs> that he did so because he was God come in the flesh as well, can't we? So, that was what they would know. They would have heard these names. They would have heard the stories about John the Baptist and Jesus of Nazareth. And so he's beginning there where the people are, where the congregation knows. Perhaps he's had a, 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 a conversation, not only with Cornelius, but others, and he knows uh, what they're thinking and uh, what type of people they are and uh, the kind of religious understanding they have. And so he begins there. So by way of application, we can say this. When we talk to people about the faith, when we talk to people about our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we must always seek to find a starting point. And that's what Peter is doing here. I remember when I was uh, in university in the Christian Union there, there was one particular guy um, there, who always started at the same point. He had his ABC to the gospel, and it didn't matter wh what you believed, but it didn't matter whether you were a Muslim or a Buddhist, he, he still started at the same point. And of course, it, it doesn't work like that. You need to find out where people are, what they understand, what they believe. So a good point often is to start with what they know. And sometimes they, they'll tell you, but what did these people know? What did these uh, people of Cornelius' acquaintances know? Possibly they knew only that uh, there was a man called Jesus of Nazareth. And they'd heard uh, that he was a good man. And he was a prophet. He was a teacher. He was a healer. Uh, but what Peter wants, wants to do is to tell them that there's much more to Jesus than being a, a teacher or a healer or a miracle worker. And that's because he is anointed of God. God the Holy Spirit was with him. And in fact, God was with him. And, and as I said, we could add also that he is God, God, uh, the second person of the Trinity. So what, he, what he's done is that they, they're anticipating something. We spoke about this last Sunday evening. There was an anticipation. Uh, they've been gathered together. This has been an unusual gathering. Cornelius talks about the angel. This man is coming from Joppa. One of the this former disciples of Jesus. And so they're anticipating something different, something unusual. And now he's going to tell them this. So they want to know more. But uh, when we talk to people about Jesus, what do we say? How can we say something? Well, I think the thing is, we, we cannot assume that they know anything at all these days. That certainly was not the case uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago, because most uh, people would have gone through school, they would have had their scripture lessons, perhaps they would have had a connection with a Sunday school or a youth club in the church, so they would have known something. But these days, we can't assume that people know anything at all. And we may have to start at a very basic level. We may have to start with a question. Do you believe in God? 
and then go on to say, well, let me tell you about the God. The God who is the God of the Bible and what the Bible says about him. It might be as basic as that as we try to communicate with people because people have strange ideas. I reckon if I went out on the streets of uh, Canesham or Bath or Bristol or whatever and I said to people uh, something like, what is Christianity? I'm not sure anybody would give me the right answer. They might say, oh, it just means being good and if you're a Christian, you'll go to heaven. How many of them would talk about sin? How many would talk about judgment? How many would talk about putting their trust and their faith and belief in the Lord Jesus? So sometimes we just have to start at the very basic level. We've got to find out where people are in order to tell them and to share with them the good news of Jesus. And that's what Peter is doing. Uh, he's connected with them. They know about John the Baptist. They know about Jesus of Nazareth to a certain extent. But he wants to say that there's far much more about Jesus than they've heard or understood. So the second point would be this, that as Peter puts it, we are witnesses. We are witnesses. We're, every single believer in the Lord Jesus Christ has a testimony to give. We're able, we should be able to tell people how you become a believer in Jesus. We should be able to tell them who Jesus is and why he came on earth to die upon a cross. Now listen, listen to Peter. It's Acts chapter 10, verse 39, 41. And Peter says, And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. So let's just bear that in mind for a minute. He's reminding uh, them that Jesus was this uh, itinerant um, preacher, if you like, itinerant religious man who was in Jerusalem, who was in uh, the land of the Jews. So we're talking about Judea and uh, Palestine, uh, Galilee and so on, whom they killed hanging on a tree. That's significant because that's a, a, an idiomatic expression for the cross. Well, they killed by hanging him on a cross. And that's got religious significance and overtones as well because if you were if you were hanged or if you died on a tree, according to the Old Testament, you not only were cursed of God, you were doubly cursed uh, of God. And Peter is saying this about Jesus. But here's the, uh, the amazing thing. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Now that last phrase, who ate and drank with him, is a very important phrase. Because sometimes people, people who say that they're believers or Christians, will say, well, Jesus didn't rise physically, he rose spiritually. <laughs> well, people would, would disagree with that. He would tell you, I'm a witness, I saw him bodily risen, I saw him eat and drink with us, as he says, after he arose uh, from the dead. Well, there's nothing quite like an eyewitness, an eyewitness to events. And Peter is the best eyewitness you can get, because he was chief of the, uh, chief of the disciples, if you like. Um, he was close to Jesus. He's an eyewitness to his life. And what did he say? Well, he wrote a letter about uh, Jesus, and he wrote about what he knew about Jesus in being with Jesus for three years. When, you're, when you've been traveling around and, uh, and living with somebody for three years, you know all the faults, don't you? You know all the, the things that are not quite as good. You, you get be, be under the surface to see the real person. So what does Peter say about Jesus? Well, he tells, tells in that general letter, 1 Peter chapter 2, he says this. He says of Jesus, who committed no sin. That's his eyewitness account. I was with Jesus for three years. He didn't commit a sin. He might have said, well, I've committed many, but not Jesus. Nor was deceit found in his mouth. He wasn't found of uttering any untruth. 
who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. Think of the cross. Possibly those who were hanging alongside Jesus, being crucified, were cursing and blaspheming those who were putting them to death. But Jesus didn't do that. What did he? Jesus say? He said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. He committed himself to him who judges righteously, to his Father in heaven, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. There's that tree again. That we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whom, by whose stripes you were healed. So he's a, an eyewitness to the life of Jesus. And if we can put it like this, the majesty of Jesus too. The, he saw the healings, he saw the teachings, he saw how Jesus lived. There was no sin in his life. But he's an eyewitness to his death. And we go back to Acts 10, verse 39. And he says, and we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. I saw him die. I know him dead. He became a curse for us. And uh, let's just remind ourselves of a very precious uh, text. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, Paul writes, he's talking about God and he's talking about Jesus. For he, that's the Father, made him, that is Christ, who knew no sin. As Paul now saying the same thing to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus took upon himself all our sins. Upon that cross, upon that tree, he paid the price. He was punished in our place. He became the sin bearer. He took the punishment and not us when he died upon that cross so that we would take, if we believe in him and trust in Jesus, we would take his righteousness and that we might be the children of God. But he's also an eyewitness to his resurrection, isn't he? And maybe in Caesarea, maybe amongst the, uh, the conversations that Cornelius has had over the months, over the years, they've been hearing rumours. These Jesus people, these followers of Jesus of Nazareth who died, lots of people are saying that he's, he, he rose from the dead. Lots of people have said that he lives again. And what does Peter say? Well, he's saying, isn't he? It's true. I'm a witness. And in the previous few verses, remember, he speaks about how he ate and he drank with Jesus risen from the dead after his death, after his resurrection. So let's bring that to a, an application again this evening and say this, that a testimony, your testimony, my testimony, can be a very powerful tool for the gospel and for the Holy Spirit to speak to other people about Jesus. You see, people might not accept our Bible texts, you know, when we want to prove a certain doctrine or prove something from the Scriptures, because they might dismiss the Scriptures, possibly because they've never read the Scriptures. They don't see the Bible as the Word of God. But people like to hear a story. And I'm pretty certain they'd like to hear your story when you tell them how you came to know Jesus, how you came to love Jesus, how you came to be a Christian. That can be a very powerful tool in the hand of the Holy Spirit in speaking to other people. Over the years, I've heard a number of testimonies, and I want to suggest to you that every testimony I've heard has got a common, some common features. One of those is this, that there comes a point in a person's life when they know that God is real. But there also comes a point that although they know that God is real, they know they're not good enough to be with God in heaven. And then 
through the work of God the Holy Spirit, <coughs> there comes revealed to them the one who enables us to go to heaven. And that's Jesus, the Saviour. And that certainly was probably true of Cornelius. When he calls uh, for uh, Peter to come, we're already uh, found in this chapter, he's described as a God-fearer. So he believes in God. He's, he dismissed the God of the Greeks and the Romans. Uh, his, uh, his faith is centred upon uh, Jehovah, Yahweh, the God of the Jews. He hasn't become a Jew, but he's a God-fearing Gentile, isn't he? And maybe there was an emptiness inside him as he spent his time in prayer and perhaps going down to the synagogue and perhaps he had a bit like the, uh, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. He may have had a scroll or two of the scriptures and he read them and maybe there was an emptiness there. There was something missing. Perhaps he prayed about that. God reveals that to him through an angel. You need to hear something else. There's something that you need to know. Send for Peter and he'll come and tell you. And so Cornelius needed to see for himself and to believe for himself Jesus to be his saviour, his Lord. Uh, for, for Cornelius to be right with God. For Cornelius to be a Christian and a follower of Jesus. But let's uh, go to uh, a third point and ask the big question. What's the big deal with this? Why, why Jesus? Why, why uh, send for Peter? Why preach and testify to Jesus in our 21st century? What's the big deal? Well, there is a big deal. And we see it in Acts chapter 10 and verse 42 and verse 43. This is what Peter says. And he's speaking in terms, I think, of the apostles and any Jewish Christian. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is, that, that it is he who ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins or, re or will receive the forgiveness of sins. Now, those are two important verses that uh, Peter has given there. First of all, he's, he tells the congregation that Jesus is the judge of the living and the dead. There's going to be a judgment day where all the things that we've done will come up before Jesus. There will be a judgment for our sins. Well, he says there, doesn't he, in verse 43, it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. And that will involve what we've done in our lives, our sins. And then he moves on and says, this is a witness that we receive from the Bible. This is a witness that we receive from all the prophets, the Old Testament prophets. And they've been witnessing about him. To him, all the prophets witness that through his name, through Jesus. And now he gets to the heart of the gospel, doesn't he? That whoever believes in him, in Jesus, will receive the forgiveness or the remission of sins. Whoever believes, receives. Well, let, let me just, let us stop there. Let's look again for an application here and say this. How often when we talk about Jesus, do we speak about judgment? Do we speak about sins? You see, quite often, and we probably may be guilty of this, we want to give a, a softer gospel in a way. We don't really want to upset people too much, do we? We don't want to tell them that, uh, you know, when you die, you're going to come up before God and God is going to be a God of judgment and he'll, he'll, he'll know about your bad things and some of your good things, but, you know, none of your, what you've done is going to be good enough to go to heaven and we're just uh, sinful and we need someone to pay the price for our sins. 
How often do we talk about that? How often do we talk about judgment and sins? But when you think about, about it, unless we know and understand that there is going to be a day of judgment and there, there are sins that need to be dealt with, what's the point of the gospel? What's the point of the Lord Jesus Christ dying on a cross for us? Why is heaven closed to us if we don't know Jesus? Why is it only open to those who follow Jesus? Well, the answer is this. There's a day of judgment. Uh, sins have to be dealt with. Sins have to be paid for. How are they paid for? They're paid by Jesus dying on the cross. And the sad thing today is this, that many churches, perhaps many preachers, are not preaching about judgment, a day of judgment, not preaching about sin. Uh, instead, it's a soft, palatable, palatable message about God is love, and Jesus dying on the cross is an example of love. And we're hearing it all around us, aren't we? All religions really do just lead to the one God. The death of Jesus was a mistake. It wasn't supposed to happen. Heaven, if there is one, is open to all the nice people. And if there's a hell, well, it's got to be for people like Hitler or somebody like that. But that's not the gospel. That's not the reality of the scriptures. We're all, if we don't know Jesus, and this is a, a tough thing to say, really, if we don't know Jesus, we're all destined for hell. But knowing Jesus, believing in Jesus, trusting in Jesus, seeing Jesus as the one who died in your place on the cross and paid for your sins, opens the very gates of heaven for eternal life for you. Well, let's look at the outcome of the sermon. That's our fourth point. What happens at the end of the sermon? Well, we can go to Acts chapter 10 and verse 44 to 48 to see the end of that sermon. And it is remarkable. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain that Peter probably, possibly had number two or three points in his sermon. Uh, I think he probably only got to the end of the first point. Uh, then he was suddenly stopped. But let's, uh, let's go back a bit and let's think a bit for a moment and say this. For most preachers, for most preachers of the gospel, uh, the effects of their ministry is not always apparent. Well, for Peter, it was, wasn't it? Uh, wouldn't you want to be, be like Peter? You know, you preach on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people come to faith. That'd be great. Yeah, you have all these Gentiles in front of you, you start preaching to them, and they all come to faith. That'd be wonderful. But that's not normal. For most preachers, the effects of their ministry is not always apparent. And uh, confession time, often a preacher, preacher can leave the pulpit discouraged. But what we need to be reminded, what they need to be reminded, what I need to be reminded is this, that this is God's work, not man's work. God is in control. It's God, the Holy Spirit, who does the work in a person's soul. And this work of God, the Holy Spirit, is what we see here. God, the Holy Spirit, comes down in the meeting. Let's just read verse 44. When Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And then we see what, how Peter responds to that. What happens is that God, the Holy Spirit, comes down on the meeting. God, the Holy Spirit, says, right, that's enough, Peter. That's all you need to say. Let's put an end to this meeting because there's something more wonderful to happen. And that is that these people will come to a real faith and love 
and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there are sometimes, if you read some of the revival history, of times where the, the preachers were preaching and they were stopped in their sermon because God, the Holy Spirit, came down just like here. People started praising God. People were crying out to the Lord. Now, what must I do to be saved? The, the Holy Spirit put an end. That's all you needed to say. And that's what the Holy Spirit does here for Peter. That's all you need to say, Peter. You don't have to do the other two points. You don't have to give a benediction at the end. He didn't need to because God, the Holy Spirit, had taken over the meeting. What, by way of application, we need to remember, I think, is this, that we are to be faithful in what we say and how we serve the Lord. And we need to leave the rest, all the rest to the Lord. Perhaps you've, uh, you've uh, witnessed in the past, you've talked to people, you've discussed with people, you've perhaps even argued with people, perhaps, but you know, there comes a point where we must walk away. We have to leave it in God's hands. We can't drag anybody into the kingdom of heaven. We, we probably want to, if we could, but that's not our business. We are to be faithful witnesses. We are to sow the seed. That's all we are, really. We're sowers of seed, the gospel seed. into the, And we pray that God, the Holy Spirit, will will plant that seed into the souls of people and then germinate it. Because all that God wants us to be is a faithful witness and testifier to Jesus. And that's all that Peter was, really, wasn't he? He was testifying to, uh, to Jesus. He was saying to them that Jesus is uh, this divine Son of God. Jesus is... Uh, the one that they need, and to believe in. And God the Holy Spirit came in uh, upon that meeting. When he spoke about the forgiveness of sins, God the Holy Spirit came in, and these people were crying out to Jesus and knew salvation through Jesus. You see, it's, Jesus, it's uh, God who gives the germination of that uh, gospel seed in the uh, 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 that sown gospel seed in the soul of men and women and boys and girls. It, it causes, it's, it's God who causes a soul to turn uh, from the darkness of, a, of sin to, to the light of the gospel, to be born again. It's God who causes a soul to be born again, to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. We can't do it. We're just instruments in God's hands. But we've got to be used. God wants to use us. That's the amazing thing about it, isn't it? That God, the almighty God, the all-powerful God, the, the God who in a, in, a, in a blink of an eye could save everybody, wants to use sinful human beings like ourselves as his witnesses, his testifiers, his instruments. And it's not about us never was anything about us was it and it's not about peter you know it's not that only peter can deliver that message only peter could be in that meeting for the holy spirit to come down no it's not about peter it's about jesus it's about god it's about him having the glory for him be the glory it's all about God's glory and honour. Amen. Well, let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray. Merciful Father and gracious God, we praise you and thank you that uh, the work of the gospel, the work of bringing men and women, boys and girls, to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, to, to love Jesus and to trust in Jesus, is your work, your, your doing. Uh, and we're just, we're just instruments in your hands. And we pray, Father, that we might be better instruments and more profitable instruments. Uh, we pray, Father, that you would uh, equip us and enable us to speak uh, in, in ways that will give glory and honour to you. 
and uh, to lift the Lord Jesus Christ high uh, in our own lives and, uh, and we pray uh, in the sight of others. But we realize, oh God, that unless the Spirit comes and breaks in, uh, Lord, uh, what we might say will be just words. We don't want that, Lord. We want to be true and faithful servants. And we, want, we ask and pray that God the Holy Spirit will break in uh, in our families, amongst our friends, in our communities, with our neighbours, with our work colleagues, as we just simply seek to sow precious seed of the gospel. And Lord, we will just pray to leave it with you. Because in a sense, Lord, and we know it really, that this is your work and not ours. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.